There's a 500-mile stretch of barren coastline in Namibia that's famous for its unforgiving conditions. This environment has left the shoreline littered with hundreds of decaying shipwrecks. This place is known as the Skeleton Coast, and it's also filled with the remains of animals who lost their battle against the elements. This serves as yet another reminder that death is ever-present. Over the centuries, more than 500 vessels have run aground or capsized in thick fog, rough seas, unpredictable currents, and heavy winds. Sailors who survived the wreck and managed to reach dry land often died of thirst in the scorching desert heat before they could reach safety. One of the most famous wrecks along the skeleton coast is the Edward Bolan. This was a 310-foot-long cargo ship that became trapped in fog and ran aground in 1909. As the desert encroached upon the shoreline over the following years, the vessel became partially buried in sand. Today, it sits over 1,000 feet away from the water, near two other wrecks, the Atavi and the MV Dunedin Star. The MV Dunedin Star was a cargo ship that wrecked in 1942, and the Atavi, interestingly, exploded and then sank in 1945. The most fascinating wreck discovery along the skeleton coast came in 2008. A group of diamond miners and geologists drained a man-made salt lake on a section of the coast known as the Forbidden Area. A worker spotted a copper ingot that had a trident-shaped marking on it, and the crew proceeded to notice pieces of wood and metal scattered throughout the worksite. They soon realized that it was a very old buried ship and immediately suspended mining operations at the site so archaeologists could excavate. Experts identified the wreck as the Bom Jesus, a Portuguese vessel that vanished along with its crew in 1533. It had apparently been sailing from Lisbon to India with roughly 300 sailors, soldiers, merchants, priests, nobles, and enslaved individuals on board. The ship set sail on March 7th as part of a fleet for a 15th-month round trip with plans to make several stops along the way and return with pepper and other spices from the Far East. However, it disappeared roughly four months into its journey during a rough storm off the southwest African coast. None of the individuals traveling aboard the vessel ever reached their destinations or made it back home. While written evidence is extremely limited, documents from the period list the Bom Jesus as the only Portuguese ship that went missing anywhere near the Namibian coast this makes it extremely unlikely for the wreck to be any other vessel. According to historical records, the bomb Jesus was lost near the Cape of Good Hope, which is located south of Namibia along the South African coast. The events leading up to these ships' loss are unclear. Records indicate that a storm broke up the fleet that the bomb Jesus was sailing with before winds and currents drove it several hundred miles north. This eventually caused it to slam into a rocky outcrop along the skeleton coast. Archaeologist Dier Tanoli told National Geographic that winter storms are especially nasty in the region. He said that the conditions could have involved 80 mile per hour winds and a huge breaking surf. He also mentioned that it would have been impossible for the ship to reach the shore and that even on a calm day, the blinding fog could have easily played a role in the disaster. At nearly 500 years old, the Bom Hesels is the oldest wreck ever found in southern Africa. It's also the only treasure-laden wreck ever discovered in the region, containing more than 2,000 gold coins, at least 22 tons of copper ingots, and over 100 elephant tusks. The coins consisted mostly of Spanish excelentes featuring King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, who ruled Spain during the late 15th and early 16th centuries. The hoard also contained Venetian, Moorish, French, and Portuguese coins featuring King Yao III. These extremely rare pieces were only issued from 1525 to 1538 and played a vital role in identifying the Bom Jesus. After they were recalled, the monarchy melted down all the coins that they were able to recover, narrowing the date of the voyage to a 13-year period. The copper ingots found among the wreck indicated that the ship was on its way to India to buy spices, further increasing the chances of it being the Bom Jesus. Another clue to the ship's identity came in the form of a royal letter written about a month before the ship set sail. It describes how King Zhao had recently sent a knight to Seville to pick up gold from businessmen who'd invested in the fleet. This helps to explain why the Bom Hesels had an unusually large amount of Spanish gold aboard despite being a Portuguese vessel. In addition to the treasure, 
Archaeologists found navigation equipment and personal possessions, including swords, muskets, chainmail, dinner plates, cutlery, and trinket boxes. The only human remains found among the wreck include some toe bones inside a shoe, indicating that while at least one person died on the ship, many or most of the people on board likely made it to land. At that time of year, the weather would have been cold. Anyone who survived the initial wreck would have found themselves stranded in a remote place where nobody was looking for them. Noli said that the group could have survived if they were resourceful enough and sought help from local hunter-gatherer populations. While their fate is unclear, none of them ever made it home, indicating that they likely perished at some point during their quest to stay alive. Prominent Portuguese archaeologist Francisco Alves told National Geographic that the discovery of the wreck itself was valuable. It's extremely rare to find such old ships of its kind, and the Bob Hezel gave experts an opportunity to learn more about these vessels. It's even more rare to discover a centuries-old wreck left untouched by treasure hunters, making the discovery unprecedented, and its contents are teaching researchers a lot of new information about past trade. A mitochondrial DNA and isotope analysis traced the ivory to the forest elephant, a species native to the humid forests of West Africa and the Congo Basin. In fact, scientists identified 70 distinct lineages and could only link four of them to modern-day herds. Until recently, they believed that forest elephants left their native habitat for a drier environment as recently as the early 20th century, most likely due to hunters driving them out of their native environment. But some scientists believe that the 500-year-old tusks found on the bomb hezels came from elephants that were killed near the coast, indicating that the species may have left the rainforest as early as the 16th century. Different elephant species generally stick to specific regions and habitats, but the discovery puts the animals in a mixed environment and shows that they may have chosen to relocate long before they were nearly driven to extinction. While the animals' reasons for migrating are unclear, the possibility suggests that they may have already been affected by human activity on a deeper level than previously thought. The problem's roots may date further back than anyone realized, but the exact dynamics remain unknown. Speaking with Science News, archaeologist Paul Lane explained that the variety of lineages in the findings indicates that the elephants may have been killed in West Africa by various communities who supplied the tusks to trading ports along the continent's east coast. In other words, perhaps they didn't stray too far from their natural habitat after all. It's also unclear whether the ship acquired the tusks from multiple small ports along the coast or a large trading port. For conservationists who are trying to save today's forest elephants from extinction, this information is significantly more important than the monetary value of any treasures found on the bomb Jesus. Forest elephants, who are smaller than savannah elephants, remain under the constant threat of ivory poachers. According to the African Wildlife Foundation, they currently occupy just a quarter of their historic range, after having roughly 60% of their population killed off over the last decade. Learning more about the species' past movement and the movements of ivory can help researchers better address modern-day concerns revolving around the illegal market. Experts predict that it'll take years for them to fully examine the bomb Hezels and the thousands of artifacts that were found with it. Speaking with National Geographic, nautical archaeologist Felipe Vieira de Castro described the ship's discovery as a game-changer that will offer insight into the period shipbuilding techniques as well as what life at sea was like. They hope to understand things like how meals were prepared and what types of items people chose to bring with them. Records have revealed that Portuguese sailing vessels were some of the grandest, most advanced ships of the time. It was precisely this technology that enabled the Portuguese to sail to far-flung places that had only recently become accessible. These ships were also well-decorated, and when the bomb Hezel set sail, it was draped with vivid silks and velvets, along with raised flags that billowed proudly in the wind. Owned by King Hal III, the sturdy, well-built ship was brand new when it departed for its ill-fated journey. But there's still a lot researchers don't know about Portuguese trading vessels, according to Castro. In addition to the lack of examples to learn from, a catastrophic earthquake, tsunami, and fire destroyed the building housing the vast majority of Lisbon's maritime documents in 1755. Maps, charts, and shipping records were all sent tumbling into the Targos River after the building caught fire and collapsed and were lost to history. 
Not only is it rare to discover an intact shipwreck, locating historical documentation about Portuguese ships and commerce is like finding a needle in a haystack. This makes the search for information extremely difficult and complicated. The bomb Jesus may not have evaded plunder if it weren't for the presence of the heavily guarded De Beers diamond mine, which has been operating since the early 20th century. After the first diamond was discovered in 1908, a 10,000 square mile section of the skeleton coast was closed to the public. No bodies allowed there without the permission of De Beers, hence the property's nickname, the Forbidden Area. The off limit zone consists of 200 miles of coastline meaning there could be more buried wrecks waiting to be discovered. Archaeologists also had the copper ingots found on the bomb Jesus to thank for the wreck remaining intact. If not for their weight keeping everything in place, precious artifacts would have been washed away by storms and waves, according to Bruno Vers, who's the director of the Southern African Institute of Maritime Archaeology. The ingots also helped to preserve the elephant tusks by pushing them down into the seabed where they were protected from the unforgiving ocean. Time and nature still took a heavy toll on the wreck, which was found scattered over a several mile area. Its contents are the only reason it didn't disappear completely. Sailing technology has come a long way since the bomb Jesus, yet ships and boats continue to wreck along the skeleton coast. It seems that man-made machines are often no match against the brutal forces of nature there. One of the most notable modern disasters to make headlines happened in 2013, after a South African sailing enthusiast named Mike Kuhn sold all his worldly possessions, quit his job, and set sail for the Caribbean. His ship was a 43-foot yacht called the Miski. Kuhn left England with a crew who spent a month teaching him the ins and outs of sailing. He then continued along the voyage alone, with plans to meet up with his girlfriend at his final destination. The weather forecast predicted four days of somewhat difficult conditions, but the crew reassured Kuhn that he could handle the journey on his own. It looked like the weather would stay nice for a while after the impending storm passed. By his third day into the voyage, Kuhn was encountering swells of up to 13 feet as he struggled to lower the sails. He tried to wait out the storm, but eventually started to panic and called for help. A tanker called the Aqua Fortune diverted from its route to rescue Kuhn but struggled to get close enough to help him. He tried to grab a rope that the crew threw down from the ship, but ended up stranded in the water for an hour and a half while the Aqua Fortune turned around and came back to search for him. This time, he held onto the rope for dear life and made it onto the ship. By then, he'd gone two days without sleep, and he collapsed from exhaustion the moment his feet hit the deck. Kuhn abandoned the yacht and returned to South Africa in his wetsuit with just a few dollars to his name. In the meantime, the Miski drifted until it appeared on the shore of False Cape Freer, which is located along the skeleton coast. It took some searching, but those that discovered the ship were eventually able to track Kuhn down to let him know they had located his boat. After enduring such a traumatic ordeal and losing everything he owned, Kuhn had decided that he was done with sailing. He told the authorities to collect any valuables they found on board. However, he was not interested in retrieving the yacht which joined the ever-growing collection of wrecks in the region. Unlike the bomb Hezos, there was nothing valuable left on the Miski. Anything the authorities did find wasn't worth traveling to Namibia to retrieve, especially considering the tight budget Coombe was on following the disaster. In 2014, the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources clarified that it would decide what to do with the wreck. Although, it's unclear whether a decision was made or if it's still sitting at its resting spot along the skeleton coast. Thanks for watching. Would you rather survive a shipwreck and make millions off an autobiography or discover a shipwreck full of riches? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And while you're at it, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time. Bye.